Good morning. Good morning. Oh, I'm Jamie. Um, can I have everybody stand up as we read the word of the Lord? I'll be reading 1 Samuel 13, 5 through 14. The Philistine is assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that their army was hard-pressed, they hid in caves and thickets <clears throat> among the rocks and in pits and cisterns. Some Hebrews, Hebrews even crossed the Jordan to the land of Gid and Gilead. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought... Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and anointed, appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, would you, Lord, forgive us when we are like Saul and take, take things into our own hands, when we turn against you and then we make excuses, Lord, we all do this. Lord, we're sorry, and we ask you to build in us trust. Trust in you and trust in your ways. Lord, we pray this simple prayer in your name. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God's people shouted. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I feel like I need to apologize to you because the, the service has been going so well. We've been singing songs with joy. We have cake afterwards because it's our two years. And Erica and Sarah are now uh, pastors. We recognize that. And here is this sermon about Saul's fall. Like it is, it is a deep, it's a sad story. It's a change. Last week, I feel like we were talking about Saul's rise, and some of you are like, yeah, you seem like you were having fun up there. I didn't know you were so funny, and blah, blah, blah. That was last week. This week, it's like, geez, this is, this is going to be a hard sermon. I have this image for you of like the Lord and what he does. And uh, this is not a science. This is not how DNA and science work. But in my mind, this is the analogy for us that that if there could be some test where by which we can predict the future in our bodies and say, oh, in a couple years or a couple months or whatever from now, you're going to have this disease or you're going to have this tendency, you're going to have this uh, addiction. And and what we can do with your DNA is is to go in surgically, like under a microscope, with a tiny little pair of scissors and cut away this tiny little thing. Maybe that's just a tiny thing that is a symptom now, but it's going to get, it's going to grow and it's going to turn into this horrible thing that's going to lead to death. But if today we will just look at our lives and, and allow God to cut away this tiny little thing that shouldn't be there, that doesn't belong there, and to use his scissors. Every scissor has two blades. One of the blades is going to be trusting the Lord and the other blade is going to be repentance. If we this day can, can think, and I'm going to ask you this same question at the end, and the question is, what is it in your life? And it's just between you and the Lord. You don't have to announce this to anybody, but I think maybe the Lord will bring something to you this morning. And what is it in your life that you know, oh, Lord, I, need, I know I need to cut this out. I need to allow you to cut this out of my life so that things don't turn into a Saul situation where here we see a tiny little piece of Saul's heart, but it is going to get so bad for him. He is going to turn so far from God, and we're going to see that in the chapters to come. But Lord, help us as we look at the story to see ourselves and to cut out with the Lord's scissors something that doesn't belong. So with that, 
Three points this sermon, if you're writing things down, three points. The first is to trust in the Lord. The second is going to be to uh, repent when we need to repent. And the third is really kind of a review, like what does it look like when a heart trusts and repents? The first point is this, trust God with your whole heart. Here's the story that Jamie just read, and, and it's uh, to be summarized. You're like, well, what? I didn't even see it. Some of you might even missed it. Like, well, what's the big deal here? What, what did Saul do that was so bad again? Well, here's what he does. Some Philistines, kids would say, they're the bad guys. And I guess in the story, they're the bad guys. They assemble with their chariots and their charioteers and men as numerous as the, do, do you remember what it said? As the sea, sand on the sea. That's the sand on the seashore. Okay, I know what I'm saying. It's, it's a Saul and Samuel on the seashore, right? Um, they're numerous. And Saul and his army are posed up against this huge battle. And it says the men hide in these nooks and crannies. And the men are fleeing. They're scared. Saul is scared. And he is supposed to do what? He's just supposed to wait until Samuel gets there. And Samuel is to be the one, the prophet, who is going to make an offering to the Lord. And instead of waiting, what does Saul do? Well, he kind of waits, and then, and then he turns out, he's like, well, he's had enough of waiting. And so he makes the sacrifices himself, and, and right on time, Samuel shows up. And it's like, you, you should have just waited another little bit, because here Samuel is, and, he, and they have this interaction, they have this conversation, and Saul does, whatever this story is about, Saul does something he knows he's not supposed to do. Saul does something wrong here, and it's not right. Uh, I, I heard of a piece of advice um, I read this book by a, uh, a minister when he was a young minister, uh, just starting his career uh, years ago, he got to meet Mother Teresa, and he was so excited to meet Mother Teresa. I mean, who wouldn't be? She, we would know now that she would become a Catholic saint. Pretty cool. I would love to have met her. But he was so excited to meet her, and she's like, he's a young minister. Hey, what should I do? What should I do? Tell me how to live, blah, blah, blah. What should I do? And he, she smiles and gives him just a simple piece of advice. She says, you'll do just fine if you spend time with the the Lord every day and never do anything you know to be wrong. That's good, simple advice. And here Saul, we don't know what his daily devotional life looks like, but here he is doing something he knows to be wrong. Here's the story. I'll read this little portion here. Saul remained at Gilgal and all the troops, all his troops, the Israelites were quaking with fear. Verse 8 says, he waited seven days. The time is set uh, by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings, and Saul offered up the burnt offering. He does wrong here. He doesn't, he, I guess he, uh, according to his own little rule, and Samuel said, wait seven days, he kind of does do that, but Samuel was just right, he was just a little late, because it says later that he shows up right as the offering was, was like completed, he showed up. So you, you, got, you got to kind of wonder, wasn't that the same day? Like, like, I guess you waited the seven days, but it wasn't the ending of the seventh day. He doesn't wait long enough, and in our day and age, um, you might think, well, what's the big deal here? You know, people change their mind. I think uh, one of the down th things that our, our, our world, our society, because we have cell phones, we could just say, oh, I decided to do something else and text your friend. Oh, I decided to be late because, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. We, we can change the plans and do things. But here Saul was told, you, you will wait until Samuel comes and he will do the offering. And for whatever reason, he's afraid he takes it on his own and does something he's not supposed to do. And I always wonder, like, what was he hoping for here? Was he hoping to make this big offering and then go win the war? And then Saul would be seen as this great man who is not only the priest who can do the offering, but also this great warrior, this great king. Saul, Saul, he's our man. <laughs> like, is that what he was hoping for in his mind? Like this, yay, I'm going to be the priest and the king and the warrior. Is that what he was hoping for? Is he grabbing this situation? Uh, maybe so. And it seems like he's like forcefully trying to coerce, coerce, is that the word? Thank you. Uh, God into, he's using this religious ceremony to get the people rallied up. He's like, look, I, no, we don't need Samuel. I can do this myself. Come back. I know you're scared and you're hiding, but come on back. I'm going to put on this religious show and, and we're going to win this war. I put, I put it down like this. I did not come from much 
as Saul might say, you know, I didn't come from much, but here I am, a self-made man, and I can do all these things. He's taking this situation, and we will see later that he won't let it go. He's grasping it, and he, he wants everything to go according to his plan. He is not trusting the Lord. Here's a quote for you. Uh, the road to sin, which I think Saul is in sin by doing this thing he knows he's not supposed to do. The road to sin is not a long walk. It's a quick trip. The long road in our life is a long obedience in the same direction. It is the narrow road. It is a long road. People from the outside might look at us as Christians and say, man, that's a long, boring road. And why don't you come over here and have some fun? Why don't you do this quick thing? Why don't you come down this alley? It's, it's fun over here. Look how much fun we're having. And say, no, those are quick side trips of sin. Saul is taking a shortcut here. He is not trusting the Lord. And it's, I think it's in these day-to-day decisions that we make, that, that here I wrote down this, God is either everything or nothing for Saul. When Saul wants the victorious battle and riches more than God, God becomes nothing for Saul. Saul takes away his trust in the Lord. And to quote Eugene Peterson as he's uh, commenting about 1 Samuel here, uh, Eugene Peterson, the, 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 the man who uh, just passed away a couple months ago, but a leader in the Christian faith, someone that I looked up to, wrote a lot of pastoral books, and, and he's the one that translated the, the message paraphrase. He says it like this. He says, um, this, like this day-to-day setting, this setting for, is for understanding faith and obedience. This, like day-to-day stuff, this is the setting for understanding faith and obedience. And we see Saul not trusting in the Lord, but trusting in a, and he's like putting on a religious show to rally the men. He's not trusting in the Lord. He's put, taking things into his own hands. I try to think of a... Um, like, what would this be like in our day and age? And I thought of a, a, a story that, that happened on a mission trip one time for me a couple years ago. I was on a mission trip, which mission trips are really... Raise your hand if you've ever been on a mission trip. Lots of people. Good. I think mission trips are vital to uh, the life of the church. I think they're vital to individuals and Christians going outside of our comfort zone, literally going uh, outside of our country to do what Jesus said, go to all the world and, and preach the gospel and make disciples. And I I've been on quite a few mission trips, all of them wonderful and, and beautiful. I, I, sometimes I think, like, I go there to serve, but oftentimes it's, it's something in me that grows more than I'm able to give. And more about this later, but a sneak peek that this summer, New Life Manitou is going to go on a mission trip. Um, that I'll get some more uh, details to you. I think, uh, I, I'm hesitant to say anything because I think the trip is already full. I announced it to our volunteers, which is uh, a, a godly good reason to be on our volunteer team is that you hear about opportunities first, and so I think uh, the trip, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little details, um, just because <laughs> uh, I can. We're, it's the Republic of Georgia, which is in the, the north part of the Middle East, and uh, we have, New Life Church has a missionary there uh, that has been a New Life missionary for over 25 years, like as, almost as long as New Life has been around. This lady has been partnering with New Life Church, a New Life supported missionary. We've sent lots and lots of teams to her over the years, and so when I heard about an opportunity to basically do an encounter night of worship, but to do an extended, to partner with them in Georgia, uh, the Republic of Georgia, for an extended time to pray over this people group. You can Wikipedia them. It's called the Vonic People Group, who are a very unreached people group, like 99.999% of them are Muslim. Many of them have never heard the gospel. There's a lot of racism against them in this area, in this place. And so, um, the trip will be uh, to, to them. So anyways, I'm kind of rambling. I don't think we even talked about uh, sharing those details. Probably shouldn't have because uh, the trip might be closed. We've already, we might already be capped. But anyways, mission trips are a really good thing. Back to my story. I was on a mission trip uh, years ago to uh, Guatemala. And the first day of the mission trip uh, was just a hard day. For some reason, we, we didn't have lunch. Lunch, like we were traveling and missed it, so we had some snacks. And then uh, later that day, and it was like a late dinner for us. We, it was, our team it was like a New Life team, and a couple other churches that we partner with were in Guatemala. I think it was like 50 people in all. Uh, we were at this uh, like 
cool, rustic, uh, legit Guatemalan hotel, and we were sitting down in the, in the kind of the lobby area waiting to, for our meal that was going to be served, and we just smell the, the enchiladas and the delicious foods being cooked, and on our tables was chips and salsa and fresh, like picked off the tree that morning, fresh, like guacamole, and it was all covered, so we weren't supposed to get into it yet. Maybe they didn't get the memo that in the United States, when chips and salsa serve, you can eat that before you pray. Amen. <laughs> so we're all starving. It's a late day. It's a late dinner. And we're waiting for the food. And, and we didn't really like, where are the leaders? There was some overall leaders of the whole trip. And we're like, where are these people? Uh, it turns out that they were in the kitchen and they were making sure all the food was getting ready. And they were praying for us. And they were praying and saying, like, we should use this moment. Like, everyone is hungry, but on this mission trip, we're going to go to some villages where people don't have three meals a day. We're going to go to some pretty poor places where uh, there's not enough to go around. And our hunger should be for the hunger, the righteousness of the Lord, and to give. Like, here we are. I know we're hungry, but we're here to give. So these leaders had this prayer uh, that they were going to lead us through. They had this beautiful moment planned. And here we are. Uh, we didn't know that. We're in the um, we're in the lobby, kind of waiting. Like, what's going on? And one of the guys on the New Life team, so under me on my team, stood up and said, "Hey, everybody, let's pray. We got to eat. We got all this food." And he's like, "Bow your heads." And he did this quick little la da da prayer. Yeah, uh, what did he say? Rub a dub dub. Thanks for the grub. Amen. Let's eat. And everybody's like, "Yay!" Everybody starts eating, and then comes in the leaders. And they, they come over to me and they say, did, hey, did you, uh, did you say to that guy that he should pray? Like, what happened? And I was like, no, I didn't. And they filled me in this situation. Well, we, here's the deal. We were in the kitchen. We, we knew that everybody was hungry. We were going to pray. And tomorrow and this week, we're going to go to some villages where there's not enough. Like, there's people that are hungry there. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. And they said, would you go talk to that guy? And I said, yes, I'll go talk to him. So I go to the guy. I say, hey, uh, who, do you know, you pray? there. Uh, thanks for praying, but um, here's the situation. And I told him the situation of what the leaders had planned. And he said, ah, oh, I am so sorry. Unlike Saul, like, so here's the comparison. Saul doesn't say he's sorry at all. Saul does, just starts making excuses. This guy was just like, ah, oh, I knew when I stood up that something was wrong. I knew I should have just waited. I am so sorry. He said, can I go to the leaders and say, I'm so, yes, of course, go to the leaders. And so he said he was sorry. And then it just, it, it kind of just was water under the bridge. It was okay. Like the opportunity was lost, but it's okay. We had a great mission trip. That guy learned and grew. I learned and grew on the trip. And I think it all came down to like his ability to, to repent, like this guy in Guatemala, unlike Saul. Let's look and see what Saul does. This is point number two, leading us to where we should go. Point two of the sermon is turn to God and repent. I feel like um, a guy on a busy street corner holding that sign, repent, the end is near. But isn't that, I mean, isn't that actually good news that, that, that the Lord, that we can repent? We can't, you know, we can't, I heard a quote, uh, we can't recreate the beginning, but we can make a new start now and we can change the ending. We, we can repent now. Although we've messed up, we can repent now and change the course uh, of the direction. Uh, I think about this quote. I'm lead, uh, reading uh, the sayings of the Desert Fathers, these really hard sayings from the 4th century, that these monks that just go out and live in the desert by themselves and pray and worship the Lord. And there's some writings and some sayings of things that were gathered. And they said this, the greatest thing a man or a person can do, the greatest thing a man can do is to throw his faults before the Lord and then this is kind of like a, a Debbie Downer, to expect temptation to his last breath. Like we in this life, you know, we can repent and look back and say, yeah, Lord, we're so sorry. But then be sober about there's going to be more temptation. That The road, the long, narrow road is just that a long road where there will be lots of temptation. And so we need to continually throw our faults before, Lord, we're so sorry. So here's the story. Um, getting back to Samuel and, and Saul. Saul makes the sacrifice he's not supposed to. And then it says this in verse 10, just as he was finished making the offering. Not sure how long that process took, but it was like perfect timing. Samuel does show up. Samuel arrived and Saul went out to greet him. What's up, dude? How's it going? 
And Samuel says, what? That, I'm just, that's a paraphrase. Uh, what have you done? Asked Samuel. And then to paraphrase again, to quote uh, Will, Will Smith from uh, Fresh Prince, when he gets in trouble, he, there's this scene where he says, well, what had happen was, and he begins to tell the story and kind of make up lies and excuses for what had happened. And I think maybe, the, not comedically, but in the same way, Samuel says, what in the world is going on here? And Saul begins, listen to what he says here in just a second. It's excuse after excuse after excuse. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, instead of repenting, instead, I, 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 he's, listen to what he says. And Saul says, when I saw the people, so he blames three other groups here. When I saw that the people, that's the troops, uh, were scattering from me, and that you, he blames Sammy, you did not come within the days appointed. Turns out he probably did because it was the seventh day. He was just a tad late, but he blames them. When you did not come within the appointed days, and the Philistines, a third group, he's blaming everybody but himself. The Philistines had mustered at Michmash. I said, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord, which is kind of an excuse. That, that's all I was trying. I was just seeking the favor of the Lord. That's all I'm ever doing. That's all I, you know, I'm just all about seeking the favor. It's like, no, you're not. Because we find he, you're not obeying the Lord. He's just saying it. He's, he's a, uh, a king of, of what appearances, this, this Saul character. And then he says this, uh, so I forced myself, is what the ESV says. I forced, I didn't want to, but I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. So he blames. Who does he blame? Well, he blames the troops. He blames Samuel. He blames the enemies. And then he said, I didn't even want to, you know, I, I forced myself and I made this burnt offering. Excuses, excuses, excuses. This is uh, a symptom of a very disordered, disturbed heart of Saul. He did something he knew to be wrong, and then he makes excuses after excuses. This is pretty bad. And what's going to happen is that the Lord is going to remove Saul from being king over Israel because of this. And you might think, whoa, isn't that an a overreaction on the part of God? I, I don't think so. I think this, what this is showing is a small symptom of what Saul's heart is, because we are going to see him fly off the handle later on and go down and down and down a very deep, dark hole away from God. It would be like if someone was... Um, in a group like sharing a story or something. And then in the midst of their story, uh, they had a symptom. They said, man, I'm starting to get some cold sweats. That's weird. And then they keep talking and sharing the story. And then they say, man, I'm, my chest is just a little tight. And they say, I'm going to keep going. Uh, it's here, blah, blah, blah. They're telling the story. And then all of a sudden they say, oh, man, my left arm, man, that left arm's really, really tingly. It kind of hurts. And someone like Linda's a nurse, uh, Ryan's wife, Rebecca's a nurse, someone like stands up with a little aspirin and comes running up to this person and says, sit down, chew this, eat this right now. And everybody's like, whoa, why are they overacting? Just because his arm hurts a little bit. But what's probably going on is they're having a like that, the tale tell signs of like, they're not re overreacting. The, that person is doing what they should to save this person's life because those are little symptoms of a very raw, a heart that is going astray. And here, in the same way, this, this is a symptom of Saul's heart going uh, horribly wrong. It is a diseased heart, and the Lord is pointing to that. He is, the Lord is. Um, rejecting Saul as king. I don't think the Lord here is rejecting Saul. I think the Lord is rejecting Saul as king. And I think the Lord says to us no sometimes to the things we want, but I don't think the Lord looks at us and says no to us. I think the Lord says no to the things we want, the directions, the things we're grabbing at. The Lord says no, but the Lord loves, and I know the Lord loves Saul, the Lord loves us because he loves everyone, and that's, that's a part of his good promise that he shows to humanity. Point number three is this. So the first one was trust in the Lord. The second was repent and turn to God. And the third point is this, kind of a combination. What does this look like? Well, a person after God's own heart trusts and repents. So in the midst of this conversation that Samuel has with Saul, 
says, you're going to be no longer king because you're not trusting the Lord. I am going to appoint someone who is a man after God's own heart. And spoiler alert, this person is going to be David. Yeah, it's David, the king, the, the one, the only King David. Let's compare, shall we, uh, King David and Saul because here's something interesting. Uh, there's another chapter in the Bible, a very famous chapter in the Bible. If you don't know it, ask your kids. They probably know about it. It's the story of David and Goliath. You know this passage. It begins very similarly to the passage that we just read today. It begins with the Philistines setting up shop. Here today we read, your six, what was it, six, 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and all, uh, men as numerous as sand on the seashore. This first Samuel 17 starts off similar. The Philistines assembled to fight Israel. There were 3,000 chariots, 6,000. Wait, that's, that's, that's the one today. First Samuel 17 is now the Philistines gathered forces for war, assembled, and it's going to talk about a champion from Gath. We know his name to be Goliath. And it says this in the, this first Samuel 17 about Goliath. It says, whenever the Israelites saw this man, they all fled from him in great fear. So very similar parallel stories between today's story and first Samuel 17, the story of when David arises. And in this story, today's story, we see the men uh, running and scattering in fear. And Samuel does things uh, untrusting of the Lord, takes the sacrifice on his own. In this next chapter, we're going to get to this in a couple weeks as a foreshadowing, as a spoiler alert. Similar situation. The Philistines, they have lots of people. They're all afraid. Men begin to scatter. And guess who just runs into battle with full trust in the Lord? David. Like he's probably 15, 14 years old. He runs into battle with like almost a crazy amount of trust for the Lord, an insane amount of trust in the Lord, running in with nothing. We, we will see but a sling and some rocks to kill a giant. Think about how different these two men are, Saul and David. And think about this. When David is confronted by his sin. We'll get to this. Spoiler alert uh, later on, but David is going to commit a pretty horrendous sin. He's going to take another man's wife, and then to try to cover it up, he's going to have that husband killed, and he is confronted by his sin. Just like today, Samuel is con uh, Saul is confronted by his sin, and what does Saul do? Well, what had happened? Well, he makes excuses. He, he it's no. What does David do? Do you know the story? As a, as a spoiler alert, Nathan the prophet comes to David and says, you have sinned against the Lord. What does David say? I have sinned. And he, the Psalm 50, uh, Psalm 50 uh, that says, have mercy on me, O God. David writes this psalm that, that was still recorded and, and written down as one of the psalms, this great repentance. Have mercy on me, O God. According to thy great mercy, according to the multitude of tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. This long a uh, beautiful poem about how sorry he is. This is what um, a, a man after God's own heart looks like. This is what a woman after God's own heart looks like. It's when someone fully trusts and is able to repent before God. I think this is why the book of Matthew, when it opens, the gospel of Matthew in the New Testament opens starting to talk about Jesus. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. The very first words on the page that Matthew recorded, records, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David. Like he wants the reader to know, like this David, yes, this one, this one who is after God's own heart, he, Jesus, is in the same line, the same destiny, the same uh, group of people, and Jesus is ultimately God himself, bringing people to trust in him and to repent, for the kingdom of God is near. I, uh, as I conclude today, and just kind of recapping about trusting in the Lord and repenting, I want to bring us back to that question that I asked at the beginning. Would you stand up with me as we, uh, I'll restate the question and the band can come up. And as we prepare to, to receive communion, the question was, what is it that the Lord uh, needs to, to remove from your life? Maybe there is something full-blown and it's, it's coming right to your uh, imagination right now and you know 
you need to allow the Lord to get rid of that. Or maybe it's something that's just right now, it's just a secret. Right now, it's just this tiny thing. Right now, it's just a symptom. It, it might just be like Saul's heart. And, and you're like, well, it's not that big of a deal. You could make excuses around it. But you know that, that even now, as, as I'm asking this question, and this question is just between you and the Lord, um, there's something in your life. There's something in all of our lives. There's bits, there's pieces that, that we need to remove uh, with the Lord's help and with the Lord's scissors. The Lord, that he might come in and, and take away this thing so that it doesn't grow, so it doesn't become death and disaster in our life. Would you pray with me? Lord, we invite you in, Lord, as you are the, the great shepherd, Lord, in this analogy, you are the great surgeon who lovingly comes in with uh, scissors into our life. And, and like a doctor, doctors sometimes cause pain, but ultimately doctors are there to do surgery, to do what they do for our health. Lord, we invite you to do what you need to do in our lives for our own health, for your kingdom to come, for your will be, to be done. And Lord, the, the scissors, the blades of the scissors are trusting in you. So Lord, we trust in you with all of our heart. Help us, Lord, to trust in you further. The other blade of the scissor is, is repentance. And so, Lord, where you convict us, Lord, we repent. That we have, Lord, not honored you with every bit of our life. We have been like Saul. We have made excuses when we should have just said, I'm sorry. So, Lord, we are truly sorry, Lord. We humbly repent before you. Lord, we, we make our ways straight before you with trust and repentance so that you can come inside of us and, and make you your way straight, that your way is better than any other way, that your goodness and your mercy are following us, because Lord, you're the great shepherd, you're the great surgeon, Lord, we invite you here today.